Hello, everyone. I'm Frank Garza with Lean Startup Company, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Today's topic is Startup Outlook, what's currently on the minds of entrepreneurs. And moderating the discussion is our own Lean Startup Company faculty member, Elliot Suzel. Our guest is Theron McCullough, Managing Director of Silicon Valley Bank's Early Stage Practice. This is the first of a six-part webcast series we're doing with Silicon Valley Bank. We're excited to partner with them and share their expertise in helping innovators move their big ideas forward. We'll be sharing founder stories from their portfolio of startups, the processes and methodologies they use to innovate, and their insights into the market and startup community. And with that, I'll hand things off to Elliot. Hello and welcome to this week's webcast. My name is Elliot Susel, senior faculty member at Lean Startup Company, and we have none other than Theron McCullough, who is the managing director of the early stage startup practice at Silicon Valley Bank. We're going to be hanging out together to review their report on the U.S. startup outlook for 2019. Theron, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you for having me. So before we get started and get into the details of the report and some of the findings we want to highlight, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Thanks, Uh Yeah, I've, I've actually, when you count up the years, it's, it's um, reminding me my, of my age. Uh, in 2004, I started, uh, I actually joined a startup um, and uh, it was a very, uh, very meaningful time in my life. And from that point on, um, I've just continued on that same course. Um, that same company I took uh, to uh, the first graduating class of tech stars in 2007, moved to Boulder, Colorado. I uh, really got into consulting and helping companies from seed to launch. So worked on medical software, worked on GPS products, um, uh, traffic conditions. Type products, things like that, uh, got into the uh, the venturing and venture partner activities as well. Um, a couple of years later, I uh, I focused in on uh, Pivotal Software. I don't know many people heard about Pivotal, but it's just enterprise level um, software growth global. How do we get to 100 million users? Um, that taught me a lot about the problems and corruptions of enterprise software, enterprise legacy companies, and startups that were building products. To and, and for those those companies that were having a difficult time connecting. Um, then I got uh, a little bit deeper on the venturing side and started investing and now I've been with uh, Silicon Valley Bank for just over a year um, and very fortunate to, uh, to continue focusing on all that, just uh, helping startups. Nice. Well, this, you know, you've been at startups yourself. You know what it's like to be in the weeds, which is really helpful context for uh, helping us understand what these results ultimately mean. So with that said, let's dive into some of those questions that we have and uh, explore this report a little further. Okay. I am really excited to review this topic today. You've put together a bunch of data uh, about people's perspectives and what's actually happening in the startup world. And we're going to have a link in the description of this video that you should check out if you want to Look at this report side by side as we're actually walking through some of the results from that report. Now, today, we're going to hand pick a few of the insights that we found to be particularly interesting, but honestly, the entire report was worth a read, so please do check that out when you have a moment. So the five topics that I'd like to cover today are related to hiring, the number of executives that are uh, female versus male, how easy it is to raise funds, what the realistic long-term goal for a startup is, and U.S. entrepreneurs' outlook on where things are going to be spicy in the coming years. How does all that sound? Sounds great. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Okay, so let's start with hiring. Because hiring is a topic that everybody's got to deal with, big or small, startup or not. Uh, and the insights here were kind of interesting. Talk to us about what you found related to hiring. Well, I, a lot of it is not surprising. 
Um, we've actually seen some consistency over at least the last three years, although we've been collecting this report for 10 years. So legacy information um, is really interesting when you look at the long term. Um, but what we've seen is a, a large percentage of companies not only need to hire, um, but find difficulty in hiring. And they, even more in the state of the economy is they are hiring. Like companies are trying to hire. So that's a good economic outlook as we're looking for uh, new good quality talent. Um, but at the same time, I think that talent pool and finding geographically where we can, where we can help, especially in the startup ecosystem, um, to cross pollinate that talent is continually to be difficult. Um, at the same time, we have to have a, uh, we have a lot of areas to work on when it comes to finding good talent for startups. Yep. I'll say, you know, looking at the report now, something like 80% of the startups that you got <clears throat> said that they wanted to be increasing their workforce, which like, I don't know, to some extent, I don't, I don't know a startup CEO who doesn't want to be increasing their workforce, sure. right? having the means and all the other stuff associated with that is, is a different question entirely. But what I thought was a really fascinating insight was um, the graph that's just next to it, which asks, how challenging is it to find workers with the skills necessary to grow your business? And 29% found it extremely challenging. 62% said it was somewhat challenging. And 9% said it was not very challenging. Let me tell you, that's almost one in 10. I, I Everywhere I've been, it's hard to find the right talent, right? I, I, I don't know. I thought it was surprising that there are some folks sitting there and a not small number going, yeah, this is easy. We got this. Yeah. I think there's a there's some areas, and I think you'll cover this a little bit later, like um, AI, which is really interesting. Or let's say it's something new like a, a blockchain or a crypto, where like, hey, we just raised a bunch of capital for an engineer. That's really exciting. And even if it's even if it's not the most or the best performing company overall, you're going to get so much experience. You're going to learn so much. So I think that nine percent is exemplary of the, hey, what's happening in AI? What's happening in an autonomous vehicle? I want to work for that type of company. Um, and those are assumptions, I would say, where in the other uh, the other sectors are very interesting, very intriguing, um, but there's there's uh, less bodies to choose from. Mm -hmm. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, although definitely related to hiring, and we'll talk about this connection in a moment, um, is the percentage of startups with at least one woman in a leadership position. And I, I thought the data you found here was incredibly encouraging, which is that the percentage of startups with at least one woman on the board of directors has gone up in 2019, and the um, women in executive positions has gone up also in 2019. This, this is tremendously exciting. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree, and they're both at an almost ten percent increase from last year, which is really neat. And it also lets me, I think, the bigger question for me too is, uh, what does it mean in twenty twenty? If we keep on gaining a ten percent increase over the next three to five years, are we really going to have a balanced org? Are we going to have you know a balanced team of people from different backgrounds and different um, perspectives to really help teams grow and flourish? and not be so lopsided and one-sided as it um, has been in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know from a hiring perspective um, and having worked at tech startups that having a diverse team from, from many perspectives is absolutely critical. And, you know, especially from a tech perspective uh, and building tech orgs, that if you don't get diversity early on in the growth of a tech org, uh, in particular in attracting uh, women to that workplace, it can become very, very difficult to make it later become a diverse work environment. Um, so it's exciting to see that things are moving in that direction, and it's certainly the right direction. Yeah, um, I, I agree. And I've worked a lot in this area. Um, and also as a founder myself, I found having a unbalanced team and how that really hurts um, mm -hmm. trying to deploy product. Uh, where I was really missing the mark in some areas that would have been much easier exposed if I had a, a different perspective and I had more of a, a balanced team of people looking at the problem that we were trying to solve um, as a team. Mm -hmm. So 
Shifting gears a little bit, uh, one of the things that startups all need to be thinking about uh, is their ability to raise funds when they need to. And the environment for raising funds is absolutely critical for growing new startups. And what I noticed is that startup uh, founders or, or those entrepreneurs you talk to seem to think it is easier to raise money now than it has been in the past. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I also find this pretty intriguing. Um, I want to bracket this a little more. Mm. So what we've found is yes, it, so w what has happened in the, in the community is the same amount of money is being deployed, but it's going to less companies. So there's more, almost more money floating around, but it's going into, and what we're finding is going into companies that have proven product market fit or proven some form of uh, revenue, or let's say anything less than a million in, in revenue or AR, um, something like this, they're still having a difficult time. Anything north of, uh, let's say, raising the Series A, the amount of funds that are invested in those companies is that's where it's easier to raise. So mm -hmm. I think they're, as a whole, uh, generalized as a whole, the investment community is looking at um, and raising funds with a thesis to focus on companies that are maybe post or currently Series A and deploying capital in there, where the Investments going into pre seed and seed companies with maybe no proven product market fit, lower revenues are still having a difficult, if not even a more difficult time because that capital is, is going to be a little bit more established company. Ah, okay. And in looking more closely now, I'm looking at page five of the report for those of you who are following along. Uh, it's indicating that 71% of US startups surveyed successfully raised capital in 2018. And this was what this next bit is what was sort of surprising to me. Of those, one quarter say the fundraising environment is not challenging. Not challenging. Yeah. Which, which is an improvement over, it looks like, 2017. Yeah, um, and I would say that that also is in the same vein as companies raising a post-series there, right around that series A. Where a lot of times they've, they've proven, look, we're making some decent monthly recurring revenue. Look, we have annualized revenue now. It's a little bit safer bet, but it's still a risk, still a high, <clears throat> still a venture, right? But the, uh, the capital is being deployed there. Um, so yeah. that's where I can see, hey, if you're, if you're, the other interesting thing is then if you're hitting your marks and if you're hitting your goals and your milestones, then it's easier to do that follow on investment. But the other thing that's interesting is there's more data for both the investment community as well as the startup community to start to validate these assumptions. So you're not looking into the ether and saying, yes, I think so, but we're using tools and techniques to validate this and say, yes, I, I think so, but there's this also, I know so, because of what we've proven and, and how we've not brought it in good fit. Yes. Well, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from Edward Deming, who says, in God we trust, all others must bring data. <laughs> and so, yeah. yes, I love the fact that it, it makes sense that these organizations that have data to prove that they're headed in the right direction are having kind of an easier time. And, you know, the nature of Lean Startup as a whole is to try to find ways to gather that data, to gather those leading indicators that would help us learn, are we even headed in the right direction at all? So it makes sense that those who can gather that data would find it less challenging to go and raise funds. Yeah, certainly. And there's also there's also something else happening and, and I think you'll you'll get to it eventually, but the the mechanisms in which you raise money and the ability to have better understand on how you raise capital as a founder has changed too. Mm -hmm. There's more venues to raise money against. There's more questions of should we IPO or should we grow a company or should we take that? Um, in the end of the day, you'll hear a story of a, a great company that did so well and they IPO'd, but then the founders are left with nothing. You know, they don't have any equity left by the time they raise and then they raise again and they IPO. So I think a lot of companies are more looking at that as an ecosystem saying, wait a minute, do we actually want to IPO? Do we 
want to keep on raising capital? Do we want to use a different mechanism? Maybe it's maybe it's venture debt. Maybe it's something that I can retain mm-hmm. equity, or it's a it's something that I don't have to give away so much of my company at at worse terms, and I can buy myself some time, do something like a venture debt round, maintain some equity, so I can open that office or hire those people, and then go for a larger. Let's say we find this product market fit. Now let's go for a larger Series A, and and really hit the ground um, in a bet, much better position, where I retain more equity, where I have a longer run rate. Run rate, excuse me. Um, and those are uh, some things that I'm seeing as well. Hmm. Okay, that is very interesting, and I see the details of that here for those following along are on page six of the report, and they are really interesting. Um, you know, I kind of want to talk about. What's on the next slide, which is page seven of the report, about the realistic long-term goal for the company? And what I thought was really fascinating here is that while people are saying more than they have in the past that um, it's not so challenging to raise funds, their long-term or end-game goal is more unclear, it seems. So the thing I'm looking at is in the the bottom right, it says that um, in 2018, 9% of those uh, surveyed said they didn't know what their realistic long-term goal was. And now it's up to 15%. They don't know. Position, IPO, stay private. Like, eh, who knows? Yeah. I think those are uh, just, uh, I mean, that 6% increase in one year is a pretty big jump. Yeah. Um, also, when you talk to, you know, your your coach as a founder, say, well, whenever someone asks, you know, don't say I don't know. <laughs> so, right. You know, say, well, we're going this, and I'm sure this is our true north, until we find something else out different. Um, but when you say I don't know, I think it, it also has those. Well, we might want to do something different than the traditional fundraise. We might want to do something than the different um, different than the traditional IPO. I'm not really sure until we hit that point what our decision is going to be, where previously there weren't so many options. So there weren't, um, it wasn't bubbled up that you could say, wait a minute, I can look at it different. There's another way for me to raise money. It doesn't have to be this, this nebulous. I go into the venture capital world and, and raise some capital and then go that route. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'm, the other thing I'm, I'm hearing too is the, as a CEO, you you want to maintain or have control of your company. Except, you know, you have this outlook, and there's not some what what I feel founders are are also fine is once you raise the price round or the institutional round, you kind of you can lose that level of control if you throw mm-hmm. someone else on a board seat. And say, Wait a minute, the company is going in a direction I didn't want it to. Um, I'm not comfortable with that. Or, wait a minute, I don't want to make this org adjustment, and here now I'm obligated to do that, where you can, uh, as a founder, and say, wait, I, there's either a serial founder, and you said, that was a bad experience for me, or there's just more data out there to say, hey, here's here's a founders, what we didn't like. So consider this before going that route. I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, sure. And when I jump down to page nine, of this report, something that I thought was kind of interesting is what entrepreneurs think the future of the sort of innovation economy might look like. And you've got information about 2019, and then you've got information about what's going to happen in a decade. Talk to Mm -hmm. me a little bit about like what the difference is over that period of time and what it means for, I don't know, well, where we should be hunting and maybe where we should be investing. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, we kind of break it up and it's almost if I was to look at it from a business perspective, it's, it's immediate wins versus long-term wins or long-term success. Right. So we, we now more than dipped our toes in artificial intelligence. We now are deploying products that it's not, we just included in your slide deck because it sounds good. But we're actually doing some deep tech that's making a meaningful difference. So I think there's going to be a lot more investment going that way. 
Um, the community also, um, looking at the report, agrees that whatever it is, whether it's a component of your your chat bot or it's actually something that's saving lives, it has some sort of AI component to it, some sort of uh, triggering mechanism. We've seen it even in, in agriculture and all types of areas where that's just going and growing uh, deeper and deeper and getting better and better, where that's, that's kind of the immediate win. Right, that's what we see right now. Um, the other, other longer term, what we've seen some in, in health tech as well, um, life sciences um, in general. I, I just think that's a really interesting subject matter. We've actually been living and working with the same technology for decades in some cases, and relying on this as, as oh, this is a uh, this is the standard. This is how it's always been done. Um, and coincidentally, I even read an article this morning uh, just with. Uh, focus on on push rates and things like this where where there's a MIT engineer who got into um, kind of the birthing practice because she said there's no technology surrounding this yet everybody's having babies always and we haven't even looked at it. I mean even those mm-hmm. subjects and as granular as that we're like wait a minute we need to start looking at this now. So I think that's really interesting. Um, and then the longer longer term I think um, and the report shows too is Autonomous vehicles, um, you know, that's that's really interesting. Everything from from your commercial, um, your personal driving, your commercial, um, the trucking industry, even the freight industry, um, things like this. You have companies um, just not even making it autonomous, but companies like Flexport that are just putting a little bit of data behind it and really helping to save um, hundreds of thousands of dollars and organize. Um, this data in a way that makes sense. And, you know, what are the next five steps? And I think that's really kind of what this report is showing in that long term as well. Yeah. You know, I think that's such an interesting um, data point that autonomous transport becomes number two for what entrepreneurs say will be big in a decade. Uh, and it doesn't make the top five at all today. And I wonder if a part of that has to do with just the regulatory environment and the idea that Maybe over the course of 10 years, folks will be a little more open to autonomous transportation of people and goods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I I also, you know, having spent a little bit of time in the taxi space uh, as well myself, I think it's going to be really interesting to see kind of how that industry evolves, in particular. You know, I know among some of my colleagues, we've been joking for a while that, you know, we'll have a car that will, you know, have it drive us to work. And then instead of parking, we go put it in the Uber mode and it just drives around and picks people up and drops them. Right. Like, it's very interesting to see where that might go and what the implications will be for society, by the way. Certainly. Yeah. Um, And uh, I mean, I see this. So right now, my in my role, I'm very fortunate that I, I'm able to connect with a lot of founders and a lot of startups. We actually have about ten thousand companies in our portfolio right now that are in that early stage area. Um, so it's really neat to see what's coming, like with, with drones and agriculture, with drones and hoteling, with you know all types of uh, driving and how people are looking at it and different. Um, if we could even circle back around to these balanced teams and having more females and workforce, more people from different backgrounds and cultures, you're addressing, you're able to combine and address some of these issues and problems that you never thought was a problem. You never thought was an industry changer or a life changer or um, something in, in, in areas or fields that just haven't been touched yet that are just uh, very like, and ready for disruption. Yeah. I'm excited to see kind of what the future holds and what our startups are going to bring us because I know there's often some really exciting stuff there. And you're very much on the front line of that. I would love to hear just a little bit more about kind of what you're doing with Silicon Valley Bank and how that might be interesting to some of the folks in the lean startup and entrepreneurial audience. Sure. I'm always excited and happy to talk about this. Um, we're, uh, I'm again in a very fortunate role. My whole job and with the team that I work with is to just help companies 
or very much pay it forward. Um, we, because we deal with early stage companies, um, the founders themselves, nor, nor does the bank know how successful they're going to be, where they're going to need help. So the best thing we can do is just put our foot out there and say, look, we'll be the first ones to raise our hands and help you make that connection to a possible investor or a possible client or your next engineer, um, things like that. And also and what I'm very excited about and recently is we're, we're doing more matchmaking of startups to startups. Uh, what I mean is that if there's a, if there's a hiring platform that uses AI to help you hire your first head of sales or engineer, then we can help that startup meet you trying to hire the first engineer and say, look, there's technology that might help you do better, get there faster. Because we have such a breadth of uh, portfolio companies that work with us, we can really help to make those introductions, which is uh, super exciting for me. There's, of course, the we love to be involved and engaged with, with lean startup, with other companies. We do a lot of events and engagements of not just networking, but high quality networking. So we're, I'm, I'm definitely of the, the school and coming from a founding background. Um, sure, I love to go to a party, but I only have so much time in the day and I really need to be effective every day, all day long. So if I go to that thing, I want to make a connection. I want it to be high quality. I want it to add value to my team and myself. So we really focus on on matching. For example, we'll do a an event where we don't just match or don't just bring a, a VC to meet with the founders. We'll find a VC that cuts that check that the founders are looking for, that has a thesis that matches what the founders are building, and then we'll put them in a room together and see what happens. And stuff like that is, is just phenomenal. I mean, we see investments made um, within weeks of, of activities like that. And it's, uh, it's, it's what makes me wake up every day and uh, mm. excited to come to work. Very nice. Now, if folks wanted to get in touch with you, and I very much appreciate having your time to walk through both the report and to learn a little bit more about the, the work that you do, um, what's the best way to get in contact with you, either to, to talk about some of the normal work that you do or the report that you put together? Sure. Um, there should be a link below, as you mentioned. Um, we, you can always reach out to startups at svb.com. Um, and I'm happy to have people reach out to me personally, too. It's just my first name at svb.com. So they're on T-H-E-R-O-N at svb. Um, yeah, more than excited. Don't hesitate. I'm uh, mostly in San Francisco, um, but travel a bit, too. Uh, and we also have a, a global footprint. So if you're in Australia or you're in Mexico, reach out. We can have uh, someone there that tours regularly to, to just be there and see how we can help. Very nice. See, I thought you were offering those places because you were saying you wanted to take a trip to those locations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, call me out. I'll do that too. <laughs> uh, very nice. Very nice. Well, we'll have all of that information in the description. We'll make sure that uh, you have access to it as a viewer and we very much appreciate having your time today to walk through this stuff. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thank you, Elliot. I uh, really appreciate it and enjoyed the conversation. Awesome. Any other closing thoughts or things that you want to share before we kind of wind down and wrap things up? Um, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there's, yes. there's more than you can put in one episode. Um, I just know the uh, what it's like to build a business. So. It's uh, as a as a technology startup. So um, keep it up and and don't listen to anybody, but listen to everyone at the same time. <laughs> Very nice. Yes, yeah, some of the best <laughs> ideas sound totally insane. Airbnb, <laughs> right. sleep on a stranger's air mattress. Uber, get in the car with a stranger. You got to listen to everyone and yet no one. I like that advice. All right, my friend. Well, thank you so much again for joining us, viewers. If you've got any other questions. Contact information will be down below. If you want to reach out to me at Lean Startup Company, education at leanstartup.co is the way to reach me. And until next time, take care, everybody.